Hi guys, welcome back to 30 Days of Physics. It's a 30 day physics challenge. Please do not be confused. This is just something like flashcards to help you keep on your toes, to keep reminding you of the important stuff, but in a quick way. All right, so let's get started with vectors and scalars. Now, vectors are quantities that have both size and direction. And scalars, on the other hand, are quantities that only have size. Another word for size is magnitude. So sometimes you would see instead of the textbooks, um, instead of the word size, they would use magnitude. Okay, it's the same thing. You can write it on your exam papers, but if you want to sound learned and educated, you can use magnitude. All right, so here are some examples of vectors. Um, so we have force, displacement, velocity, acceleration, and momentum. So those quantities all have size and direction. Whereas the examples of scalars are mass, length, pressure, distance, and work. So those only have size. Now, to work out um, these these quantities you would find that with vectors you cannot simply add you have to actually draw them out you have to draw out the vectors and usually vectors and scalars are represented as as arrows right so you would represent them as arrows but with the vectors for sure you cannot just simply add or subtract them you would have to use the parallelogram um, method or the polygon method depending on the where the arrows are traveling and you will see that just now with scalars though scalars are easy you could just add and subtract you just have to know you just have to learn the conventional method of the additions and the subtractions and we're gonna get into that just now okay so here we have a nice exercise so it says the addition of vectors and again, I said we have to draw them. You have to draw scale drawings, right? So in both methods, the resultant force is obtained via scale drawings. And you're probably saying, what? What is a resultant force? Well, at this point, if you don't know what that is, well, you could quickly learn it right now. So let's start with the parallelogram method. We have two arrows going away from each other, okay? So they're going to start from an origin. Um, you could call that origin O or zero or some letter and they move away from each other from some point of origin so what you would do with the parallelogram law with this you just basically draw a you complete the diagram by making it a parallelogram right so if this side is a and this side is b then whatever you draw over here will be b prime and the matching side for up here will be a prime so you, you draw and they have to be the same length so if this is a length of a then up here again will be a prime so it should match right so this will be our a prime and then this side over here will be our b prime okay so you just complete the diagram and get a parallelogram the resultant force will go from the origin to origin prime here so you just draw it here okay with a ruler not freehand like this and uh, the length here would be the resultant force so this would be our resultant okay so this is how you do it with the parallelogram method you just complete it by doing this um, yeah so pretty easy now with the polygon method now if the arrows are not meeting at the same point so they're going in one direction and they meet up again here you just complete the diagram you don't make a you don't make a, um you don't finish it into a parallelogram you just join the, the the beginning to the end and since they're all going up you just keep going in that direction right so you complete here and this would be your resultant Okay, force. So let me write the word force. 
And again, these are not simply added or subtracted. You actually have to draw them on paper. And I always tell people to start drawing these on graph paper because then you would have a more accurate drawing. You actually have little lines to help you with your drawings. Okay, so now to scalars. Now, as I said, scalars are much easier, easier to contend with. All you're doing is adding and subtracting, but let's note some important things. By convention, forces that are moving to the right are assigned positive values, and forces that are moving to the left are assigned negative values. So right then, then, once you know that, you are on the way or on the road to victory. I drew my arrows to match the size of the forces, and here I have 10 newtons, and I have 2 newtons. They are both moving to the right, and remember it said if you're moving to the right, then you're assigning positive values. So you just add them. So 10 plus 2, because they're going in the same direction, you get an overall resultant force of 12 newtons moving in the direction to the right, or you could say moving to the east. Because right is east, right? right? So you remember your coordinates. You have north, you have south, and you just spell we. West and east. So you could also say moving to the east here. I tried to make it complicated, but don't get scared. So we have the same forces from up here. I just moved them over here. And we have the same forces moving to the right. And then we have a force moving to the left. So if you're moving to the right, you're going to be positive. So I put those instead of a bracket, and we're going to still have the 12, right? 12 newtons. And then if you're moving to the left, you're going to be negative. So I put that here. And I put it in order of how it was drawn so you don't get um, confused along the way. And so if you have 12 newtons, so 12 newtons minus 7. So if you write this out, in a way that you want to understand it, you just do something like that, and you end up with five newtons moving to the right. Many times you're wondering how I know if you're moving to the right or left. Just look to the side that has that adds up to a larger number. This is a smaller number over here. This is a larger number over here. So wherever the larger number is, is gonna move in that direction. Okay. So there you go. And now I went even further to hurt your feelings, but I know you don't get easily hurt. And so let's learn how to answer this. You just have to follow the rules. It's just a bunch of rules to follow. So by convention, forces moving north are assigned positive values. So if you're going up, you're assigned a positive value. And if you're going down, as in salt, you're assigned a negative value. So then if you know that, you just have to put your um, your signs directly in front of the value that you have. So here we have four forces acting on an object. You want to see in which direction the object is going to move. So we have a force acting in the southern direction which is 9 newtons. So we're going we're going to use we're going to calculate the forces um, based on the directions. As you can see here I have vertical forces separated from the horizontal forces. So with the vertical forces we have 9 and 10. 9 is moving in the south so 9 is negative and 10 is going to the north so 10 would be positive and we end up with 1 newton and because this side is bigger it's going to move in the northern direction. With the horizontal forces, we have um, 8 newtons and 4 newtons. We have 8 newtons moving to the left and 4 newtons moving to the right. So we make 8 negative and we have 4. We keep 4 positive. You have negative 8 plus 4 will give us negative 4 newtons. And so the negative sign only indicates the direction that it's going in, really and truly. So once you have that, you already know you have a negative sign, you're moving to the left okay so you're moving to the left or to the west side and so you just drop the negative sign after that once you know how much force it'll be moving with to the left so this object will be moving in a northwestern direction if you want to say it like that okay so if two vectors are now um, acting away from the origin, okay, at right angles to each other. So 
let's just do this. That right angles to each other. So once that right angles to each other, you can actually um, use Pythagoras' theorem. And this is where you have trigonometry coming into play. Trigonometry. Okay. But first, let's deal with this. So we have a right angle triangle here. So we don't have to draw to scale anymore. We could just work it out. And so we would know that if we label this side as A and we label this side as vector B, then whatever is opposite, okay? So opposite this side will be A prime. And then opposite this side would be B prime. Okay, and so look at it now. The resultant would be the hypotenuse, and we call that C. If you look at this, you will see that it's C squared equal to A squared plus B squared. That is the equation or formula for Pythagoras' theorem. Now, C is always known as the hypotenuse, and I already labeled it as C. So to solve for C now, you would say C squared is equal to a squared plus b squared get rid of the squared and whatever you do to the left you have to do to the right you end up with now c is equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared and we could solve now so we already have just note that sides a and b are the shorter sides the hypotenuse is always the longer side the longest side of the three sides so if we get an answer that is shorter than the longest of the two sides that are short already then you have a problem okay so whatever answer you get for the hypotenuse must be longer than either of the sides that you have here so let's go ahead and calculate so a squared would be 10 newton squared because that's side a and B would be 8 Newton squared. That's say B. We're going to end up with uh, 100 Newton squared plus 64 Newton squared. That calculation now will be 164 Newton squared. The square root of 164 squared is 12.8 so you have 12.8 newtons okay so it is indeed correct because it is longer than the two sides the two sides are supposed to be shorter now suppose they want you to find the angle that is between here you have to use trigonometry and you just have to remember these okay so if you have sine sine is so s over s equals to o over h cosine is pronounced as ka so that's cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse and then tangent is toa right so that is equal to opposite over adjacent and you say so Ka to right? But I said toa so remember it, right? So this is how you do it. Now all you got to do is find out the sides. You have to label the sides. Now any line that is opposite this angle right here will be the opposite. We call that the opposite side to the angle. Or you could look at it this way. This is a right angle here. So if you have a right angle here and an unknown angle here, or unknown angle here, that is not right angle. This line that have both angles touching it will be known as adjacent. Then what I would do, um, if you know adjacent, then you already know what the other sides are. So the long side is always the hypotenuse. So you label that as hypotenuse. And then obviously the other side will be adjacent. You only have three sides to worry about. The adjacent, the hypotenuse, and the opposite. If you don't know how to do it this way, just say to yourself, draw a line from the angle 
if you draw a line from the angle to the opposite line that will be the opposite and once you have your opposite you could go from there because you would already know what your hypotenuse is okay so that's out of the way now suppose you want to find the angle and you use you use the adjacent and the hypotenuse side okay so using adjacent and hypotenuse you're looking for the angle so you can say i want to find the angle using the adjacent and the hypotenuse look for the thing look for the equation that has adjacent and hypotenuse in the ratio section so we call this a ratio over here does this have it no does this have it yes you have adjacent and hypotenuse right here in the ratio section so therefore you can just put cosine and so the adjacent side is actually 10 newtons and so yes so you see it's best if you just write out everything you need first so we have adjacent over hypotenuse and so we know that adjacent will be 10 and then the hypotenuse now would be um, 12.8 so let me put that right there because we found it so it'll be 12.8 newtons and to solve for this now we could just we could write um we could solve the ratio first so we said 10 divided by 12.8 and that will give us 0 0.78125 okay and now to solve for the angle you would do the inverse of cosine put that whole number up in there and that will give us now thirty eight thirty eight point six degrees okay now we would have looked at uh, adjacent and hypotenuse suppose we only had the opposite and the hypotenuse now suppose we only had those sides labeled so we'll look at what is opposite and hypotenuse in the ratio and we see it's sine so it's not tangent it's sine so we say sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse and so we said we want to find the angle so we're looking for the opposite so where is opposite this is in a case where we're only given the opposite and the hypotenuse so we would say um, um the opposite is eight newtons and the hypotenuse is 12.8 newtons right and we're looking for sine right here so what you would do you would say sine theta is equal to 8 divided by 12.8 and you get something like 0 0.625 and then you find the inverse now because you want to find the angle so it's the inverse of sine of um, 0.625 Should get the same answer so I got 38 point around 7 right so the answers are pretty much the same so you would know that you would have worked it out correctly if you got the same answer doing using two different sides so you notice that you would use a different operation each time you move the side so in this case if you have adjacent and if you had adjacent and hypotenuse, you would use cosine. If you had opposite and hypotenuse, you would use sine. If opposite and adjacent, you would use tangent. Okay? So I hope uh, this helped. I hope this puts some perspective into what you are studying. And this is the end of the lesson. Woo! All right, guys. Keep on studying, keep on believing in yourself, be the unicorn that no one sees you as, and be great. All right, bye. See you for day three. Bye-bye. Be great.